Hallelujah. You know, um, the second church I pastored, I've, I've been in ministry 31 years, full time for 28 years. And when I was 22, yes, 22, I pastored my first church. <laughs> you should never do that. Um, when I was 27, I pastored my second church. I was on staff with someone else uh, before that in between. And um, at the second church was a wonderful experience and really explosive growth. And uh, we moved three times and into a building of 35,000 square foot building and uh, on the third move. And God just did unbelievable things. And when we were really just starting to fill up three or 400 people, there was um, a woman who was a, a widow and had been a widow for a while. She was very poor. And I was telling the story in the Bible of the widow uh, who gave the very last um, bit, you know, that she had. And the, the prophet had the nerve to say, well, give me some first. <laughs> and, uh, and so I thought, oh, Lord. So uh, I was doing an illustration, and I had every plan to give her her money back, um, but I just wanted to make the point, you know. And I could see everyone sweating, and, you know, I don't do things like this now because that's, it's terrifying. But I went to her and said, you know, you're a wonderful, sweet widow in this church, and, and everybody loves you. But what if I was Jesus and I asked you to give all that you had on you right now? In fact, I am going to ask you to do that and just put it in my hand. I'm all, I'm all, I'll tell you what we'll do about it later. I might put it in the offering. I don't know what I might do with it. You know, I might put it in my pocket. I have no idea, but I want you to give me everything you got. What do you think about that? And she didn't hesitate. She opened her purse and Looked in and she had exactly $20 and that was all she had. She put it in my hand. Now, everybody wanted to stone me, number one, for taking this widow's last $20. And I also felt really small. And I said, okay, Lord, how am I going to do this as an illustration before I die? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And uh, so I was trying to, but my plan was, you know, give her back the money. And so I told the story, just imagine giving your very last money and all these things. And, and I, before I got a chance to give her back her money, she said, no, keep it. I want to be just like that woman in the Bible. That is my last $20, and it's not going to help my situation anyway. <laughs> and she said, keep it and put it in the offering. I said, oh, my goodness, I'm going to go to hell for this. I know I'm going to hell for this. <laughs> and, uh, and so I put it in the offering, all right? And uh, spontaneously, people started getting up and throwing money all over this lady. I mean, literally, just putting money, just throwing money on her. And we did not know her situation. She was three months behind in rent. And the next day, they were repossessing her house. And exactly $1,200 came in, which is exactly how much she needed to pay the bill on her house. Come on, somebody. Are you listening to me? <laughs> and I just was going to do an illustration and give her her $20 back. Come on, somebody. Aren't you glad she didn't give me the $20? And, and or, excuse me, take it back. Aren't you glad she didn't get it back? Because it turned into a lot more when she gave from her heart and said, no, keep that for the kingdom. It's not going to help my situation anyway. But it did help her situation because the Lord turned into a blessing for her. The offering was a little low that day. But come on, somebody. She was, she was taken care of. And I thank God for that. Amen. It's got absolutely nothing to do with the sermon other than the fact that sometimes, uh, in fact, this comes directly. Most of the sermon series that come from just Pastor Jonathan doesn't tell me what to teach and preach. He gives me full freedom. Uh, if you're a visitor here, I'm not the lead pastor here. Jonathan Vickers and his wife, Judy, are the pastors here. Um, and she's receiving treatment uh, back home. And you're going to hear part of that because he gave me permission to read this um, in a moment about what she's actually gone through um, fighting cancer. And she's back in Australia receiving amazing treatment, and uh, but also uh, standing on her faith. And... Um, you know, the scripture says King Asa was diseased in his feet, but because he only sought the physicians and did not seek uh, God, he died. All right, didn't say anything wrong with seeking physicians. He said it's because he only sought the physicians that he died early. So we need to seek the physicians. God gave us those and also seek the Lord. Amen. Amen. And that's what she's doing. Um, and so during that time, they, the elders appointed me and the pastors appointed me to be the associate pastor and to stand in his stead, which is, uh, you know, I can't stand in those shoes, so I just have to be who I am. Um, um, he's an inspiration to me. Um, and so generally, these series have been coming from just me and him talking, and he gets me excited. <laughs> and so you can get on the phone with him and watch out, you won't get off for four hours. Are you listening to me? Your battery will go dead three times. 
And so, uh, uh, but I love every second of it. And generally, um, I will talk about, oh, me and this and that. And then he starts getting fired up. He's really, he, he's, he's encouraging me, but he's really just preaching because he just needs to preach, you know. So he just starts firing off like bombs, like, like, like truth bombs, like bam, 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 bam. And, you know, and I'm like, my goodness. And, and I started, so I just said, hey, uh, can I use that in the sermon series, you know, that I'm about to preach? I think I'm going to use that. And he said, yeah, absolutely. But you need to write them down because I'll never remember these things that I'm saying to you right now. And so I said, well, they're already copied, you know. And uh, so um, some of these are statements directly from our pastor. But I'm going to do a series starting right now called Lessons from the Fire. Lessons from the Fire. Fire being the trials that we go through, the issues that we go through, the, the problems that we have, the struggles that we have, and that there are lessons we learn while we're in the fire. And so if you're not in the fire... Am I saying to pray to go through the fire? You won't have to. It's coming. Come on, somebody. Are you listening to me? I promise you. You don't have to pray for fire. It's going to come. Enjoy the peace if you're there. If there is no fire, enjoy it. It's around the corner. Come on, somebody. Are you listening to me? It will find you out <laughs> along with your sins. All right, come on. You know what I'm saying. Um, so the Bible says your sins will find you out. Well, the fire will find you. All right, so that's what we're talking about. Uh, so I want to talk to you about this, and, and, and I don't know if we'll get into all these in one sermon or multiple sermons. I have no idea. We'll just go with it in, until my time runs out. Um, because I was looking, and I took every verse in the Bible that had the word fire in it, every one, Old and New Testament. And after I wrote them all down, I noticed that they fell into categories for me. This is just the way it came to me. And when I broke down those categories from Genesis to Revelation, every single scripture about fire, it seemed to fall into seven categories. I didn't make it that way. It just happened. You might find an eighth one if you're one of these people that are religious and like to make people feel wrong. You're like, well, kind of that's one could be this. And there's eight, you know, so, OK, well, OK, that's fine. As many kinds of fire as the Lord wants, I'll take it. Are you listening to me? I just want the fire of God. How many want the fire of God in your life? Sometimes it's disguised as trouble. Sometimes it's disguised as issues. But oftentimes, it's also Pentecostal fire. And um, so we're going to talk about uh, seven kinds of fire. We're probably not going to get through them today, but I'll tell them all to you. For you, the, the, those of you that like to write notes and it drives you crazy to have two empty spots or something, I'll tell you what all seven are. But uh, we'll pr likely not get through them today. But these are lessons from the fire. And I want to open up with Pastor Jonathan's statements to me yesterday. I'm not going to give you my statements because they're pathetic. All right, because I was whining about trouble in my life. So I'll just give you the really good statements that he said in response to my really sad statements. All right. So he said, uh, I was asking about Pastor Judy, he, and he told me, well, she has, um, she has so far three bone marrow biopsies, 15 bags of blood, 20 bags of platelets. He'd already just gotten there and already felt this small about the troubles I was talking about. All right. <laughs> I thought I was just, I, I was more, I was just feeling completely defeated by many different trials in my life. That's been going on for several years, and I just I wanted just to say, stick a fork in me, I'm done. I had so much anxiety, uh, I didn't want to admit that, but when I called my pastor, it just happens. I just broke down and said, I'm just stressed out, you know, and just told him stuff. And he didn't really talk about my issues like a good pastor should. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, he went directly to the word, you know. But first, he, and I, as I asked when I asked him about her, this is what he said. So. Three bone marrow biopsies, 15 bags of blood, 20 bags of platelets, three MRIs, eight x-rays with the dye, three kidney and liver tests, three brain scans, over 50 vials of blood taken, 12 bags of chemo, 36 chemo tablets, 16 bags of antibiotics, 12 bags of anti-nausea, and she comes up smiling every day and thanking the staff and being so sweet to all of them. Um, and... And, of course, I was talking about my trials, and so, uh, you know, that made me feel pretty ridiculous. And um, after hearing all that, um, and, and so knowing that she came up smiling, how many of you think she has to have some faith to go through that kind of fire and still be smiling? Are you listening to me? And still be encouraging staff members at a hospital and all those things. And then I was talking to you about the grief for my father's dying. I can't talk about it too much because then I won't be able to speak. All right, so I'm going to just kind of say it and then move up forward because it really still hits a spot. So, uh, see, I shouldn't have talked about it. Uh, so, uh, 10 months ago, I lost my dad. Don't want to talk about it. I'm not quite there yet, but I am getting to a place of acceptance of the fact that it happened uh, and that I can enjoy who he was as a man of God in my life. And that's about as far as I can talk right now uh, without 
losing, losing it. So I was talking to him about grief and uh, the holidays and all those things. And this is what he said. He said, grief is a tough one. He said, it takes you on a road. And I want you to know that we're doing fine. And we often thank God for the road that we've traveled through in the past that toughened us up for such a time as this. We recount the challenges and how God has brought us through them. So we automatically are comforted in the assurance that He's got this and we can do it. And I know you can do it too. Come on, somebody. Isn't that good? I said, I would add that to the Bible if the Lord would let me, but thank God He didn't entrust me with the Bible. Come on, somebody. Are you listening to me? And then he added this. It helps to laugh at yourself sometimes. That's what he said. We do that often. He said these words. Faith is the result of enduring the fire, not escaping the fiery furnace. And then I got to thinking about it. You know, all the time I think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and I think about in Daniel 3, and to me, I th in my mind, I think about them uh, escaping the fire. They did not escape the fire. Uh, when you go back and read it, they were left in that fire. And Nebuchadnezzar said, wasn't there uh, three men that we left in the fire? But now I see four, and the fourth looks like the Son of God. And so he yelled into the fiery furnace, and he said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, has God delivered you? If He has, come on out of there. And they walked out, and he was amazed because they were not burned, their clothes were not burned, and they did not even smell like smoke. Come on, somebody, are you listening to me? And uh, then this is what uh, he said to me. Faith is the result of enduring, not escaping, fiery furnaces. And he said, I do so love. I just wanted to smack him after this one. I was like, come on now, you're getting a bit a little bit ridiculous. He said, I do love the smell of that smoke. After standing with Jesus, yes, this was before he posted on Facebook, okay? All right, he said it to me first. I'm just letting you know. He said, I do like the smell of the smoke after standing with Jesus in a fiery furnace. There is such comfort in the lingering smokiness that reminds us that he doesn't shout from the sidelines, but stands in the hottest part of the flame. Oh, that I may never wash it from my garments of faith. Come on, somebody. That should be in the Bible. Are you listening to me? That should be somewhere in the epilogue. Are you listening to me? I'm going to put it in my epilogue in the Bible that I print. All right, so. And then he said finally to answer something I said to him. I'm not telling you that part. I'm just giving you his parts. He said, awesome. So it must have been something good that I said. I'm just saying. Awesome. And then he said this. You know, faith has to be the greatest journey in the kingdom of God. My God, how can we do less when he's gave us so much? Faith doesn't just fill our tank slowly so we can wait until we're full to begin the journey, preparing us for some kind of purpose. No, faith comes in the midst of the violent storm. While others seek shelter, the faithful thrive in the chaos to rescue those in harm's way. In other words, we're too busy doing the kingdom work to get too worried about the storms in our life. Come on, somebody. Boy, I wish I could get some help in here. Come on, somebody. Are you saying amen? <laughs> and then he said, faith doesn't hide from the fight, but propels us into the midst of it and leaves us shouting for more when it's done. Faith equips us on the run, not lined up waiting first to be issued with our sword and our shield. And faith comes easily upon us when we are standing on the enemy's head. Come on, somebody. And then finally he said, faith comes upon the foolish enough to dare, weak enough to trust solely upon him, bold enough to stand firmly upon the troubled waters because anywhere that's not where Jesus is is way scarier than being in a place of faith with Jesus in a thing that seems to be scary. Come on, <laughs> hallelujah. And finally, he said, ha, ha, ha. I asked God this morning what faith is, and he had me, he had you text me. He hasn't stopped talking to me about faith ever since. Be careful what you ask for. It might change your life. <laughs> and this Miss, Miss Judy then added, tell Brother Chris this. This too shall pass. Come on, somebody. Amen. Are you listening? That's a pretty good statement. Isn't that good stuff? Amen. So you may leave and have a great afternoon. All right. And so in the time I got left, I want to uh, get into the actual Bible. All right. I know it sounded like the Bible, but it was principles from the Bible. 
But First Corinthians, uh, excuse me, First Chronicles one twenty six talks about David praying, and this is one of the fires in the Bible, and in First Chronicles chapter one verse twenty six, David is praying on some land where he said, "I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pray um, and get something you know that that I don't deserve." And let me see, is that the right verse? And if it's not, I'll give it to you. First Chronicles, sorry. All I put was First Chronicles 21, 26. So that must be it. All right. First Chronicles 21, 26. Sorry about that. All right. I had it backwards. First Chronicles 21, verse 26. All right. David built an altar there to the Lord and sacrificed burnt offerings and peace offerings. And when David prayed, the Lord answered him by sending fire from heaven to burn up the offering on the altar. Hallelujah. Now, um, that's in the middle of the Bible. As If you want to go in alphabetical order, um, this is kind of in order of the way they showed up. And then as you categorize all the words with fire having related to spiritual things, um, it comes out to these seven things. Number one, the fire of separation or sanctification. Write that down. And you can use as a main uh, scripture there in uh, Genesis chapter 3 about the sword that God put to keep Adam from the tree of life. There was a separation after he sinned. There was a sanctification. There was a setting apart from that which is holy and that which is unholy. All right. So a fire of sanctification or separation. The second one is the fire of direction. The fire of direction. We're going to talk about these lessons from the fire over the next few weeks, so we won't get into all these today. And when we think about that, we think about the fire by day and the, uh, the cloud by day and the fire by night that Moses used for direction in his life to show him which direction to go into. Um, and so, uh, so he used fire. The fire of God brought direction in his life. That's why we need the fire of God. Amen. We need the fire. We need to be baptized in fire and in the Holy Ghost. Why? Because we need direction in our life. We need to know which direction to go. The third one is the fire of sacrifice. Uh, Aaron, or you could say fire of, of, of sacrifice um, or, or, or of giving of thanks or, or something like that. Because as he offered this uh, offering to the Lord, the Bible said the Lord came down and with fire and consumed the sacrifice and accepted it from the Lord and stopped a plague. And so it brought mercy upon the people. But then the very next day, uh, Nabahu and the other brother of uh, the sons of Aaron, they um, uh, tried to also offer up an offering themselves because they said, that was cool. Moses and Aaron did that. Let's do that. I would never say something like that. Come on, somebody. I would never say, you know, well, Moses did it, so I'm going to go out and do it. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to part the Red Sea or whatever. So, so, uh, so, so here's what he did. He, 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 they offered up. Strange fire, the Bible calls it. Strange fire. It means it wasn't initiated by God. It means it wasn't something inspired by God. They tried to create a fire that wasn't there. Now that's something you got to be careful about. Because you want the fire of God in your life, but you can also get false fire, or, or you can get strange fire when you try to stir up something that God isn't doing or saying. Because you want to make a move of God happen before the time. And you know what happened? They became crispy critters, as we used to say. Uh, in a moment of time, they brought the fire down right on their heads. Come on, somebody. And Moses told Aaron, don't even mourn the passing of your sons. We're just going to leave them in the street and move on because this was the judgment of the Lord. Come on, somebody. All right, listen to me. And so the next one, uh, uh, the fourth one is the fire of faith. If you look at the story of Elijah uh, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, and the story of the three Hebrew children in um, uh, Daniel chapter 3. And then, next one is the fire of worship. Uh, it's many different things, of course. All these have, I mean, dozens and dozens of scriptures, but I'm just giving you like the, the most important ones, I guess. The fire of worship, the one we just read, First Chronicles uh, 21, verse 26. Um, this was an act of worship. This was a, an offering that was given freely, a free offering to the Lord. Um, he didn't have to do it. He wanted to do it. And he, he did it as an act of worship. Now, the Bible tells us how to do that. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and then, uh, number six, the fire of Pentecost. 
And we're also going to call this also evangelism. The power of Pentecost is the power of evangelism. Why? Acts 1.8 says you'll receive power when the Spirit comes on you so that well, you can do what? So you can fall down, run around, act silly. No, so that you can go and be my witnesses. Now, I love it when the Spirit of God moves and people are moved on to get on their face. And I love it when God moves in such a way we can't speak. And I love it when we feel the presence of God like that. And I'm not against any of that. I hope it, I hope it falls on us. And I hope that you're in right with God when it happens. Are you listening to me? <laughs> and so that which could be a blessing for others could be judgment in your life. So don't ask for fire unless you really want it. Are you listening to me? And so uh, finally, um, we, we would uh, go with the fire of judgment. And that is found in 1 Corinthians 3 um, and uh, Revelation uh, chapter 20. Uh, and many, 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 many other verses that talk about the fire of judgment. All right, so we're going to talk about these lessons from the fire. And the, the reason I decided to start reading with this one, that he gave a free offering to the Lord. I didn't have any particular order, even though there is kind of an order in the Bible, but, but um, I didn't necessarily feel led to go with a certain order. I did want to share with you today a little bit about the fire of worship. Um, you know, when people... Um, come and they worship and they're singing songs. Sometimes we take for granted the worship team, the time they put into spending time with God, hearing from God, putting together the song list, all those things. And we think it's a preliminary for the preaching. And that's sad that we have done that because it's just as important as the preaching. And so is the prophecies and so are the encouragements and so is the offering and so is everything that we do as a part of the body of Christ. And so that's why, and listen, I can't preach to anybody. I often have a problem with being on time, okay? So, uh, so what do we have to do? Get up a little earlier and we've got to sacrifice our bodies and we've got to tell ourselves, get up! You know, you've got to drive a ways and you need to be there for part of the best part, which is worshiping God. And so that's why we've got sometimes Christians in America, Western Christians, sometimes take for granted worship. Therefore, we show up late and there's an empty church when the first song, and by the time the song's in, it's full. And, and I think how sad because we miss out on this wonderful time where we're supposed to be experiencing fire. Come on, somebody. And I mean, the fire of God does all these things I'm talking about. It will empower you to be a witness for Jesus. It will bring separation and, and sanctification in your life. Uh, it will do all the things that I read to you according to Scripture that it will do. It will give you direction when you're missing direction. Um, it, it will uh, help you uh, refine your faith in the middle of the, the furnace. Um, and, and it will bring you into evangelism. Uh, and, and of course, if you don't judge yourself in the end, you'll be judged with fire. And so, of course, this is why we need to experience the fire of the Holy Spirit through worship. Come on, somebody. Amen. This is important. Praise and worship. Both of them are important. You know, uh, praise, consequently, has seven Hebrew words. I'm not going into all those today. But seven different words. We just say pray. The, the Old Testament just says praise, praise, praise. Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. But there's actually seven different words there. If, if we translated it correctly, we should probably be better. Um, it's, it's really giving you seven different types of, of praise. One word is uh, Barak, it means to bow down before the Lord. Another one is Shabak, and it means to shout unto God uh, with a voice of triumph. Um, you know, there, there's other uh, words that that mean that are translated praise, but actually mean other thing. Uh, mean uh, do other things. One means to jump up and down in ecstasy, <laughs> literally to jump up and down in ecstasy. That is the word for praise in the Old Testament. Do you know that? And uh, and a lot of people don't know that. And so shouting, jumping, dancing, playing with instruments, uh, singing, uh, raising of the hands. One of the words, uh, yada, means to, to, to extend the hand. Uh, and so all of these things are, are worship and praise unto God. And so when we come to the house of God and we join with the saints of God, we worship God. But let me tell you, there's a wonderful way to worship the Lord that so many people don't think about. And it does require consecration. And it does require bowing our knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and it's found in Romans chapter 12 when it says, verse 1, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which is your reasonable service. service. Many translations will tell you the correct word there, worship. 
or some translations say it's your reasonable service of worship. And so it is reasonable worship. What is? Laying down your body, not conforming to the world, but transforming your mind by renewing it through the Word of God. And so when I'm going through something like when I felt so, it's so amazing. I, you know, I'm going to tell you, you know, something about myself. I am a bit emotional, you know, as a human being. This is how God made me. Uh, and uh, I'm just an emotional person. So, you know, when I watch football, I punch things and throw things and, and all kinds of stuff and speak in other kinds of tongues. <laughs> and so, not really. I used to have a problem with that, but I got my tongue under control uh, through the Holy Spirit. But no, I, I, I get, you know, loud and crazy about that kind of thing, and, 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 I'm, and I get emotional about stuff, and I get sentimental about stuff, and emotional about stuff, and, and all of those kinds of things, you know, when it comes to worldly things. Um, but I'm the same way in the kingdom of God. When it when I think about what Jesus did on the cross and how He died for my sins, was buried, and was raised from the dead. And when I sing songs about Jesus dying on the cross and being raised from the dead. And when I sing songs about the Lamb of God and what He has done. And when I exalt Him and think about Him and stretch out my hands, I, I give myself to Him and surrender during worship. And that is an offering that God will accept. Come on, somebody. Are you listening to me? And the Bible tells us that, that our tongues are giving praise to the Lord. And he said, uh, 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 we, we give a sacrifice of praise. We give a sacrifice. Everybody say sacrifice. And now this is a New Testament verse. A sacrifice of praise. The, the, the lips giving thanks unto our God. And so when we give thanks to God, we are giving a sacrifice unto God. We are literally taking our tongue, which is often used for evil, laying it on the altar. And, and, and the Bible says we are to be a living sacrifice. My dad always said the problem with a living sacrifice is it always tries to crawl off the altar. <laughs> And so you're constantly having to get that body back on that altar. Come on, somebody. If it's a living sacrifice, you're trying to looking around and trying to get away before the fire comes. Are you listening to me? And because you know that if it comes, you're going to miss some things that you wish you had and you're still hanging on to the world. And so this is the reasonable service of worship that God gives. And I'm going to close right here. I will tell you, I remember when the fire of the Lord came upon my life as a young man. I surrendered my life to the Lord. Yes, you can do this when I was only five years old. I was five years old. You may not know who T.L. Osram was, but he came to Birmingham, Alabama. He was uh, preaching there. Uh, he's he, one of three guys that's preached to more people than anybody that's ever lived on this earth face to face. Uh, T.L. Osborne, um, uh, he wrote the book Healing the Sick. Um, and he, he died, well, he only died in 2009 at 93 years of age. But his grandson... Uh, was there and had just been saved. This was 1982. And uh, he had just been saved. His grandson, Tommy O'Dell, had just been saved. And um, so Teal said, this is my grandson. Now you gotta understand, 1982, everybody had a three-piece suit on, all right? So everybody was wearing a three-piece suit and it was way too hot for that in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, and, but they did. They dressed up for church and especially the way we acted at church, you definitely shouldn't wear a suit. Are you listening to me? We were drenched after every service, you know? I mean, the only place you can go to church and end up in the emergency room is a Pentecostal church. Are you listening to me? <laughs> I'm not even joking. But anyway, <laughs> and so I can tell you a couple of stories. Yeah. And so uh, but but we were having a, a good old time. And uh, then he said 8000 people there, 7000, something like that. He said, is any of you pastors would like to have my grandson? He's only 18 years old, but he's given his life to the Lord. He's come out of drugs and alcohol. And, uh, and, and he's giving his testimony, preaching and evangelizing. If you'd like to have him at your church, come talk to him after the service. Of course, T.O. left. Uh, and out of thousands of people, only five pastors came down because guess what? He had long hair, way back to here, holes in his jeans. And this was 1982. He was, sacri he was sacrilegious. He was sacrilegious on the temple of God, of the, of the altar of the church. Are you listening to me? By having that long hair and holes in his jeans, he was definitely going to hell. So most of those pastors said, no, no way I'm having a, a demonic heather and come to my church and preach. Thank God my dad wasn't one of those religious freaks. Come on, somebody, listen to me. Because he came and he lived at our house for almost a month. And the man, 
him and his wife would pray in tongues eight hours a day and evangelize all night till two or three in the morning. And so I, they had to take my bedroom and I slept in, in somewhere else. And, but I would listen to them praying in tongues all day. I was five years old and I walked in the room one day and she was Dutch and barely knew English. And so I don't know how they had a good marriage. I won't talk about how it might have worked, but uh, they couldn't talk to each other. So I really don't, really don't know how they really had a great marriage, but it seems like they did. <laughs> so they seemed pretty happy and everything. And they were 18 and 17. All right. So they were just excited to be on the road, you know, and she was learning little bits of English, but he would trick her and say uh, he, she would she she looked at the uh, uh, she looked at, at some cloth, uh, you know, uh, the drapes. And, and, he, and she said, how do you say that in English? And he said, toilet paper. <laughs> and so a little while later, uh, Elizabeth came to my mom and said, you have the most beautiful, she was talking in broken English, you have the most beautiful toilet paper. <laughs> my mom said, well, thank you so much, you know. And later, Tommy was just crying, you know, and laughing and came in and said, I'm sorry, honey, but it's not toilet paper, it's called, the, you know, curtains. And so... <laughs> Uh, but, uh, uh, but he was 18. My parents were 25 years old and, uh, and I was five years old. One day I went in their room and sit down and, and they said, if, if, and I said, what language are you speaking? And they said, well, that's the Holy Spirit's language. I thought it was Dutch. And so, and they, and, and so they said, well, uh, you can have that language. It's a prayer language. And, and would you like to receive it? And they explained the baptism of the Holy Spirit to a five-year-old. All right. And then they laid their hands upon me and a heavenly language came out and I began to pray in tongues. And for the next two years, I had dreams and visions of Jesus as vivid as you can possibly have. We would fly to a swing set and he would swing me in his lap and tell me Bible stories. I would wake up, tell my parents about the stories and they would say, where did you hear that? And I said, Jesus told me last night at the swing set at Shane Scott's house, my, favorite, my best friend. And they said, you weren't at Shane Scott's house last night? And I said, yes, I was. <laughs> last night, me and Jesus were there. And, uh, and I began to tell them the stories. And it happened, I don't know, twice a week for two years. And then I finally had a terrifying dream, was the last one that I had, in which Asians were going to hell. And I tried to stop the truck of what seemed like millions of Asians from going to hell. And it did slam on its rake, brakes right before going off a cliff into what I knew to be hell. And, and, and then Satan appeared in the dream, laughing, kicked the truck off into hell. I was bawling, and he said, there's nothing you can do about it. And I woke up trembling, crying, ran into my parents' room and said, uh, Mom and Dad, I want to be a preacher. Buy me a three-piece suit because i got to be a preacher. <laughs> and uh, as the Lord is my witness, by age seven, I was recording myself on cassettes, uh, preaching the gospel for five minutes and giving an altar call. I even said, I see that hand. I see that hand. <laughs> and I would hand them out for the neighbors, you know, and I was trying to get everybody and their dogs and cows saved. Are you listening to me? And, uh, and, and I knew that was the call of God on my life. That is the fire. And that's what it does to your life. Amen. So today, ask God for fire. Ask God to baptize you afresh and anew. Ask him to fill you with the spirit of God. The Bible says nobody asks for uh, the Holy Spirit that God will not give it to them. And so ask him for that and look for that. Can we all stand together right now? And right now, if you need just a fresh filling of the spirit, I want to pray right now. And I want you to, to receive it and lift your hands up to God to receive right now a fresh noise some of you are dry it's a new year time to put last year behind you time to put the troubles behind you and time to get refilled and refired for this new kingdom year and lord we thank you right now that you baptize us with the holy ghost and with fire we receive the power of the holy ghost fill them with the spirit of god and i pray now that they receive the power of the holy ghost boldness to be a witness that they will not be afraid and they have not been given a spirit of fear and timidity but a spirit of power love and a sound mind they will be bold in the lord the strength of his might to share the gospel with the nations without any fear or trepidation and we thank you that every weapon formed against them shall not prosper and every tongue that rises against them in judgment shall be condemned the enemy shall come against them one way and run from them in seven directions because they are the head and not the tail, above only and not beneath. They are blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed going in and blessed going out. I thank you, Father God, that you have made them to be this head and not the tail. You have made them to be more than conquerors to those who are in Christ Jesus. I thank you. They can do all things 
through Christ who strengthens them. Baptize us with fire and with the Holy Ghost and give us a commission. Show us where to go. And if we don't know where to go, we're going to go anywhere until you tell us to stop. Let us not be shaken by any words of discouragement or by any circumstance that stands in our way. But we're going to take on the, the enemy and we're going to run over uh, the enemy and we're going to be willing to do whatever you tell us to do. We receive that. We decide to walk in it in the name of Jesus. Everybody that received it says amen and amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank, thank God. Hallelujah. I'll see you downstairs where we'll just continue having fellowship. And